God's grace, His mercy, and His peace be with you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Our coming Savior, our once and future King, through whom all things were made, for whom all things were made, the King of kings, Lord of lords, ascended, descended, lived amongst us, died, descended into the land of the dead, resurrected on the third day, ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of God with all power and authority, commanding us to go and preach to all nations and coming again on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory to deliver us into a wonderful promise of eternity with him. We're in Romans chapter 14. Getting there. Just a couple more, three more chapters here. Paul continues and he says here in Romans chapter 14, if you want to turn there. As for the man who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not for disputes over opinions. One believes he may eat anything, while the weak man eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who abstains, and let not him who abstains pass judgment on him who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the master is able to make him stand. Then we're going to go on and read a little more. Let's just read on a, few, a little bit more and then we'll talk about it. One man esteems one day is better than another, while another man esteems all days alike. Let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. He also who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while he who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. None of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother, or you? why do you despise your brother? We'll stop there. So what is he talking about here, ultimately? Getting along in the church as Christians and with those who are of dis different opinions and different measures of faith. There are those who are strong in their faith, and there are those who are weak in the faith. And so each one ought to be kind toward the other and deal with each person's, especially the strong should deal with the infirmities of the weak brother. Who is the weak brother in this case? Let's look at it. As for the man who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not for disputes over opinions. So first of all, my first question here is, how should we deal with a Christian who has a weak faith? What do you say? Huh? Welcome him, right. So graciously receive him into your fellowship, however, in what way? But not for disputes over opinions. Not to get him in here in order to argue with him and bash him over the head and destroy him with your arguments, which may be sound, since you're the strong brother in this case. But you don't come in to destroy someone who's weak in faith. And let's talk about what a weak person is faith. What is the weak faith? Question number two, Paul, is it specifically talking about here? As for the man who's weak in faith, welcome him for, not for disputes of our opinions. One believes he may eat anything while the weak man eats only vegetables. So who's the weak man? The, huh? The one who's narrow. Narrow, okay. Yeah, narrow in what sense? Okay. Right, so he doesn't understand Christian liberty, really. What is this guy doing, the weak person in this particular example? Eating, eating only vegetables. So he thinks that it's a whole, so the thing is not just he's eating vegetables because it's healthy. I mean, you, anybody can do that, right? So that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about eating vegetables only thinking that's what God wants. And he thinks that, oh, I better eat only vegetables because somehow meat is not a holy thing to do, especially since meat is sold in the meat market and it's offered idols and stuff. But even, even apart from that, vegetables must be good. Meat is bad. I'm going to honor by God by eating only vegetables. What does Paul call such a person who thinks that way? <laughs> You'd call him a vegetarian. And he is a vegetarian. He's faithful according to his own faith, but Paul's calling him a weak brother, right? Because he doesn't understand what? Christian.
Christian liberty. What foods did Christ declare are clean? Christ declared all foods clean, it says in Scripture. Look over just briefly at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's see another place about eating. Because that was apparently a big issue back then, what you can eat. And, um, you know, some people would only eat vegetables, some people would eat meat, others would not eat meat because it was sold in the meat market, others might not eat meat just because it's bad, they thought, spiritually. But look what Paul says in Roman, sorry, 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from that faith by giving heed to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons through the pretensions of liars whose consciences are seared, who, what do they do, these liars? They forbid marriage, number one, and number two, and command abstinence from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and to know the truth. Look at this word. He says, for everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, for then it's consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Did Christ eat meat? He ate fish. Did he eat a lamb? He ate the Passover. So he had lamb chops or whatever. Christ ate meat. He ate fish. He also probably ate eggs, since he says, which of you, evil ones, if your son asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him, oh, is that a? Pizza. Not a pizza. <laughs> pizza, did you say pizza? <laughs> You're messing with me. No. <laughs> it just slipped my mind for a second. But anyway, a stone, give him a stone. So, so obviously, guess what? Eggs, according to the Lord, are good to eat. Also, when Christ was raised, what's that? Stones are not. Stones are not, yeah. And when Christ was raised from the dead and he is there and he says, cast you down on the right side and you'll find some to Peter and the rest out on the boat. They come to land, hauling the net full of large fish, 153 of them. How do I remember 153 fish? But I don't remember stone at any rate. But they get ashore and what do they find but that the Lord has prepared a charcoal fire with fish upon it. And he says, come and have breakfast. And also, when he was raised from the dead, he ate fish, broiled fish with them to prove that he was raised from the dead. I don't think he was necessarily hungry. He was just basically showing, look, I'm alive and I'm physical. I'm not a, just a ghost. Yes. All right, yep. Yeah. Yeah, they were still practicing kosher stuff, and you're certainly free to practice kosher living, and you're free to eat only vegetables if you wish. But don't make it a matter of faith, is the point. Because if you make it a matter of faith, that's weak. If it's just, hey, I like vegetables, I don't like meat, that's perfectly okay. Or you might say, hey, vegetables are better for me than meat, so I'm gonna eat it to be healthy. That's fine, but if you start saying, I'm eating vegetables because this pleases God and I get points for them, that's weak. Because Christian liberty is you can eat anything you want as long as you receive it with thanksgiving, because then you consecrate it by the word of God in prayer. So, by the way, as a side note, the Bible does have something to say about that in terms of what's healthy and not. The kosher laws were in effect. Clean and unclean, you're not to eat unclean in the Old Testament. New Testament, you can eat with any, anything you want, provided you do it with thanksgiving. So Christ did a change there. Just like it was Gentiles were unclean in the Old Testament, Gentiles became clean in the New Testament, because God's the gospel is now going out. It's a new covenant. Now, in terms of eating, goodness, I've tried to, you know, Vivian, I've tried to eat healthily all these years, and I still don't feel great at times. I mean, I never don't usually get sick, but I don't have the energy I want sometimes. So I'm still working on it. But if you look at scripture, in terms of vegetables, the original order to Adam and Eve and to actually all the animals, we shall have every green plant for food, right? We did not get to eat meat, according to man, until after the flood. 
after the flood, Genesis 9, that's when God said, as I gave you the, every green plant, now I give you all of the animals as well. I'm thinking vegetables is probably the best thing for you in that case, or plants and fruits and things, grains. Um, meat is also good, especially in a fallen world. This is the way I interpret it. I could be wrong, but I think after the flood, the world changed a whole lot. It was, I mean, things were twice the size they are normally in the pre-flood world. People lived longer. The life of the world was healthier. After the flood, if you're going to be an Eskimo living in the Arctic, you can't live on vegetables and fruits. You've got to live on seals and whales and things. I mean, otherwise you die. Uh, it's also... Our bodies can need the meats, I believe, uh, the proteins in certain ways. You can kind of get by as a vegetarian, but you're missing some stuff sometimes. But you're also avoiding stuff. They say there's no like cancers or other things that are associated with vegetarianism, where there are those things associated sometimes with certain meat diets. So it's, yeah, it's to make your best decisions. You're going to say something, by the way? Yeah, it, he ran sheep, probably in that case for wool, I'd have to say, rather than for eating them, um, just because God didn't allow it. Maybe they ate meat in those days, but they weren't allowed to, because uh, I don't know what they did in those days, but they were not given to eat meat until after the flood. Were they eating meat? I mean, there was a wicked world. Maybe they did. Maybe they did, but um, that was not the order. The order was every green plant for food. Even the animals, interestingly enough, so after the fall of Adam and Eve and the sin entered into the world, genetic DNA and stuff must have and somehow been altered by God on account of sin. Because, you know, the animals even ate grass and things in the pre-flood, I mean, sorry, the pre-fall world. Guess what? In the worlds to come, Isaiah chapter 11, the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, a little child shall lead them in such things. So there will be no more eating of flesh of other animals and things in the future. God's going to give great foods for you, by the way. Don't worry about any of that stuff. It's like, oh man, I don't get lamb chops and stuff. Well, no, he, he got better in heaven. That's what I was going to get to next, yeah. Well, the, yeah. yeah, the Daniel, the Daniel, um, Daniel chapter 1, he's, they're supposed to eat the king's rich food, and then the chief captain over them says, you have to do this, or the king's going to cut my head off, and Daniel says, give us 10 days eating vegetables only, test us, see how we fare, if we don't look good, we'll eat your rich food, if we look good, let us go this way, the, king, the guy says, okay, 10 days, you get a test. At the end of those 10 days, after giving them vegetables while everybody else ate the rich food, guess what? Daniel and his friends were way healthier in appearance than the others. And they, they got to keep eating that way. So, you know, our food does have some impact upon us, but just know this, it's not a matter of righteousness or, or restrictions of God. You are at liberty to eat. You know, you could live for the rest of your life on ho-hos and ring-dings if you wanted to. You might not live so long if you did that, but you're free to. It's not a matter of conscience. Although we do feel bad about our conscience. I mean, it's like, man, I had a chocolate cake last night. I'm guilty. Well, not before God, maybe according to your rules or something. Pizza. Yeah, you like pizza. Pizza's good. Um, locusts and honey. Locusts are fine. Honey's fine. There's certain insects that are acceptable, certain that are not. But if you want to live healthier, I would suggest in your Christian liberty, consider the kosher laws and live generally according to them. You don't have to do it all the time. If you want a crab cake, which would be an unclean food, or a lobster tail, occasionally, that's all right, whatever. But I would say generally, if you live most of your life according to the kosher laws, you'll be healthier. So have a bacon occasionally, but pigs, no, that's an unclean animal. And uh, the fish that swim in midstream that, has fish that have scales, these are healthy for you. But the crabs and the flounders and things that feed on the bottom, not so healthy. If you think of it, the birds that you can eat and the fish that you can eat, 
Those things that live on healthy things, God wants you to eat. But the bottom feeders in the ocean that live on crap, that's not the best thing for you. Or the birds that are vultures and, and cormorants and seagulls and, and storks and things that live on, I mean, that eat on crap. You don't want to eat the crappy things that live on crap, like pigs, you know? You want to eat things that eat healthy things, basically. So, and Pilgrim's Progress, man, how do we get all this out of the reverse? Anyway, Pilgrim's Progress makes a great point about that with, when talking with Mr. Talkative, when they're discussing, says, uh, picks up on the kosher animals and says, this is a Christian life, namely, that we're not only to chew the cud, namely speak the Christian life, but we're to part the hoof, walk the walk. If you just talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk, if you just chew the cud, but you don't part the hoof, that's a false religion. So what you want to do as a Christian is being a clean animal, talk the talk of a Christian, and walk the walk of a Christian, chew the cud, and part, and part the hoof. Isn't that kind of a neat way to look at it? Nevertheless, I hope you all live healthily. That's my hope and prayer for you and everything, and for myself as well. I'm still trying to learn and figure that out. Uh, but the healthier we live, the healthier we'll feel, generally speaking. And, uh, but you're at liberty is the point here. The weak person in those days was eating only vegetables. What should the strong Christian, who knows that he has Christian liberty to eat anything he wants, provided with thanksgiving, how should he treat the one who thinks you must eat only vegetables? Welcome him, but not for disputing over opinions, and don't destroy this person's faith with your mature arguments for the sake of food. Let the guy just live in his weakness, and maybe over time you could help him to see the liberty of the Christian. But just be gentle with one another, in other words, Paul's saying. Be kind to one another. Bear with each other's weaknesses, and weaknesses of faith at times. All right? Um, let not him who eats despise him who abstains. So that's the point. Uh, and likewise, let, and let not him who abstains pass judgment on him, him who eats, for God's welcomed him. So a weak brother who thinks you can only eat vegetables might disdainfully think, you're eating meat, you are nothing, even though he's speaking wrongly. Paul says that's not the way to behave as Christians. One believes one thing, one believes another, just be kind to one another. Be patient with, e with each other on these, thing in these matters. He'll tell us the truth is that the truth is the strong person and that has the right opinion is he who can eat anything. He knows he's free. But even in your freedom, be kind to those who are not at your position and your level yet of understanding. Be kind both ways, back and forth with each other. Don't pass judgment on that person. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld for the master is able to make him stand. So you shouldn't judge your brother in these matters. Who is, who is your brother's judge and master? Same one, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the weak brother has the same master as the strong brother. So don't, who are you that, as a strong brother judging the weak brother? Don't do that. Because it's before his own master that he stands or falls. You're not his master. You're not his Lord. You're not his judge. It's between him and him alone, him and the Lord, his Lord alone, you and your Lord alone, as to how you're living. Yeah, sure. That we're justified through faith, not great faith or small faith. Yes, that's right. That's right. So we're justified not by the strength of our faith, but simply through faith in the right person, Jesus Christ. Sometimes in the new member class, I'll say, uh, you know, it's sort of like um, if, you're, if you're jumping off a cliff and your faith is super, 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 super strong in two little seagull feathers you found and you jump off the cliff and you try to jump off like that, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be dashed on the rocks 300 feet below. Though your faith was strong, it was the wrong thing. But if your faith is super, super, super weak, but it's just strong enough to... Trust in that hang glider to which you're attached and you kind of just jump off the cliff and all of a sudden you take off because the object of your faith is what makes you fly. The object of our faith is Jesus Christ. 
if your faith is weak and you're just like, I'm afraid, ah, jumping off, you're still going to fly. If your faith is strong, like, I know, hang God or support me, and you jump off and run off, you fly, both fly the same. Innocent, all he can do is receive. Although sometimes maybe their faith is stronger in some ways. But yes, that's true. Yeah. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not the strength of your faith that saves. And we say in our Lutheran confessions, it's not faith doesn't save you because it's a virtue. Faith saves because of the object of your faith, what you believe in. It's the thing that you're believing in that saves you. Why I can't trust in two little feathers and I can't trust in Buddha or Krishna or Mohammed or whatever or my bank account because those things, is, even if I have perfect faith, they have no power to save you. But Christ has power to save. So if you're a weak brother or a strong brother, your one master over both is able to uphold you. That's what he says here. He will be upheld. The weak brother will be upheld for the master is able to make him stand. So that's, he's the one who supports. In other words, the whole thing is here. Christians, get along with each other. Don't be picking on each other. Don't be destroying each other over trivial matters like food and drink, which is not what the kingdom of God's about. He goes on to another thing that people can argue about. One man esteems one day is better than another, while another man esteems all days alike. That's another point that came up in Galatians chapter 4. Paul is saying, Paul is actually chastised in the church in that case because he's like, ah, you, you observe days and months and seasons and years? I'm afraid I've labored over you in vain. What's the matter with you? Seinfeld, right? What's the matter with you? You can't do that. No, but he's, he's saying, you guys, I was trying to form Christ in you. What are you doing going back to the law? Esteeming one day is better than another. So some Christians might do that. Esteem one day as better than another day. He says, while well, another man esteems all days alike, which is ultimately the stronger position. That's the right position, because Paul later on says, in Galatians 4, not to esteem one day is better than another. <coughs> so, uh, you could say, well, even, you know, Sabbath, ultimately, because the Sabbath is only a shadow of the things to come. Right? So every day for us, ultimately, is a Sabbath day, even though it's a special day set apart, and we should rest on it, spend special time with the Lord and such things, but uh, still, all days alike. Uh, so in Christ, ultimately, every day is a Sabbath, and every day is a festival. And frankly, Christ worked on the Sabbath, Namely, doing good, that is. Healing, preaching. Let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind. That's an interesting comment. If you're weak in faith and you think you can eat only vegetables, okay, well, just be convinced in that. And if, you're, if you believe you're, you don't need to do that, okay, be convinced in that. Not that there's not a right position in that. But he says, here's the point why each of them has it's okay before the Lord, is this point. He who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord, right? So if you're saying the Sabbath day, that's this, that's, this is all got to be done here. Why is he doing that? Because he believes it honors the Lord. Is that pleasing to God? Yeah, because he's doing it because he, 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 he loves the Lord. He's trying to honor the Lord. He says, he also who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. So I'm eating my food in liberty with thanksgiving to God because I'm free to eat meat and I'm giving thanks to God. That's a good thing. He says, since he gives thanks to God, while he who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord <coughs> and gives thanks to God. I'm not eating that meat because I believe it pleases the Lord. So he's seeking to honor the Lord and that's pleasing the Lord. Even though his position's weak and wrong, because he did call him a weak brother, still he's trying to do it for the right reason. He wants to honor the Lord. So even if you're in a weak state, you're trying to please the Lord, that pleases the Lord. I kind of liken it to this. Um, you have a father and you have a little child. And the ch father says, hey, draw me a flower. I'd love to see a flower. And the kid comes back and drew this huge pine tree. And says, look, 
I drew what you asked me to draw. What's the father going to do? That's not the flower. Or is he going to go, wow, that's awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Here, dad. Happy birthday. I love you. Here's my flower. It's, it's, a, it's a big pine tree. And even though it's not the, what he asked for and wasn't the right thing, the father's like, hey, you did that because you love me. I love it. Thank you very much. I love that. That's my favorite flower you've ever drawn me, that big old cypress or whatever. Because they're doing it to honor the Lord, honor the Father. So even if you're not eating meat, which you're able to do, and you're just eating vegetables, but you're doing it to honor the Lord, God's like, hey, thank you for the gift. That's wonderful. Even though you're really free to do something else. I'd really, you know, you're supposed to draw a flower. It was a tree, but still, it's honoring me. Because yeah, they're doing it out of faith. But if you come over as the other brother and say, what are you doing? Dad asked for a flower. That's a piece of crap. That, you know, Dad, you should reject him for this. Well, the father's not going to like that kind of comment. And, and you're going to say, you know, you're trying to destroy my relationship with my child because he didn't understand. He's trying to honor me. You know what I'm saying? I'm, this is an earthly, earthly illustration. But um, he says here, he also who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while he who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. None of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. So in each of our cases, both of them are trying to serve the Lord. Let it go. Behave kindly towards one another. Um, we're living not for ourselves, but for God. The weak brothers trying to serve God, the strong brothers trying to serve the God, each as they understand it. And we're living for the Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we're the Lord's. That's a good thing too, isn't it? If I'm alive, great. I get to serve the Lord here. If I die, great. That's even better. I get to be with Christ. Whether we're all here or whether we're there, we're the Lord's. Nothing changes ultimately when you die. You know, if uh, Naomi lives with me in my house or she's in Abilene, Texas and dies, she's still my daughter. If we're here on earth or we're at home with our Father in heaven, we're still his children and we still belong to him. <clears throat> so that's a great word for us because, you know, we all got to die one day unless the Lord returns in our lifetime. But you're the Lord's now, you'll be the Lord's then. That's a good word, isn't it? It's comforting. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Cool, huh? Christ died and he was alive and lives now. He's Lord both of those who have died and both of those who are living in this world. He's the Lord of both. And by the way, dead people aren't really dead. Remember Jesus says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's not God of the dead but of the living. Even though these people died long ago in body, they're alive. So, good, are we good? So, I skipped all my notes, but... Uh, so can we say that applies to how we treat other denominations? Absolutely. So even though we don't agree... Absolutely. Doctrine. Great point. Yes, totally. Like, and I have a note here um, on some other issues about denomination, but yeah. Let's say, you know, we need to have right doctrine. You can't get a wrong, right faith from a wrong doctrine. So we treat all doctrines as important. Nevertheless, I don't want to destroy a brother who believes in Jesus Christ, who is a true brother in another denomination. I want to teach them the right way and stuff like that. But I don't want to use my argument to destroy him and say he is not saved if he believes the gospel, etc. He has to have the gospel right. But if he has a wrong belief on something else, you know, um, I don't want to destroy him over this. I want to lovingly help and instruct him, and I want to sharpen him like iron sharpens iron. Maybe also, I have a log in my own eye, he can sharpen me. I should have a lively discussion. That's okay. But let's not destroy people. For example, also, you could think of this. <laughs> we Lutherans, generally as a denomination, think beer is a great thing. You're free to do so. 
I don't like beer personally. I've always hated beer, personally. Beth loves beer. She doesn't drink it hardly, but a few times a year, but she loves the taste of beer. I hate the taste of beer. I just, me, just I always have. Yeah, it's Episcopal. I like tea and, and wine, okay? Like wine occasionally, so. Um, yeah, Episcopal, a little Anglican back there, background there. But uh, let's say you go to a Southern Baptist party. And I know the joke is a lot of most Southern Baptists drink more than anybody else or whatever, but the, officially they're teetotalers or Methodists, for example, right? Traditionally. And they say not only is it bad to drink alcohol, but it's a sin. Is it a sin? No, you're free to do so. Jesus turned the water into wine. 1 Timothy 6, no longer drink only water, Timothy, says Paul to Timothy, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So you're free to have, you're at liberty to have alcohol, but not to get drunk with it. That is a sin. But to drink and enjoy yourself and let wine, wine is given to gladden the heart of man, says the Psalms, that's okay. You can drink alcohol. But what if your Baptist brother believes that it's a sin to do such a thing, totally against the will of God, and you're going to incur God's wrath on account of it? They are the weak or the strong brother in that case. Weak brother, because you're at liberty to drink, as long as you don't get drunk, but they believe it's a sin, and it would harm their conscience terrifically before God if they were to drink it. Should you, in going to the party, or let's say you have them over to you, to a party, should you offer them a whole bunch of uh, beer? No. Even though you know you're free to do so? Even though you're at liberty to drink? Withhold for the sake of the weaker conscience of your brother, who doesn't understand these things, back off, say, hey, we're just drinking water tonight. Because I don't want to offend your conscience, I don't want to hurt you, I don't want to destroy you, and your faith over the sake of, for the sake of food or drink. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of God is about loving each other. Now, are you free to do so? Sure, you'd be free to have drink, but don't harm your brother for it. In the same way, um, you wouldn't want to entice them to drink because if you did, <clears throat> and they sinned against their conscience, if they went against their conscience, even if you're free to drink, this is a later point in this letter, in this chapter, even if it's, you're free to drink and you're at liberty, but you believe it's wrong, if you drink, it's a sin. Even though you're, it's, you're free to do so, if you drink believing it's wrong, that's a sin because you've gone against your conscience. In the same way, let's say you have a, a party back here like we used to have by the, <coughs> by the shed over there. Remember that in those days with Les Chenoweth? And we'd, build, we'd have the hot dogs and the burgers down there. Let's say we're serving hamburgers, and they're free. But you believe it's a fundraising event, you heard that somewhere, you're wrong about it, and you believe you're supposed to buy the hamburger. But you go over and you sneak a hamburger anyway, even though they're free, but you thought that they cost something. And you snuck it and ate it anyway without paying. Would that be a sin? Yes, even though the hamburgers are free, they don't cost anything. You're at liberty to have them. However, if you believe that they cost something and you ate it anyway, you're guilty. Does it make sense? Because you've sinned against your conscience. Because it didn't proceed from faith. The point in all this is just simple, is that you're at total liberty as Christians. The kingdom of God, he's going to say in a few lines, is not about food and drink. It's not what we're about. But righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is about. You're at liberty, but... Let's be sensitive towards one another. Not everybody's where you are. Maybe they're strong and you're weak in some places. Maybe you're strong and they're weak in some places. Let's be careful we don't have logs in our own eye when we're trying to get a speck out of somebody else's eye. Be careful, you know, do we have something wrong? But either way, God says in these, through the Apostle Paul, love each other, just be patient with each other, deal with each other kindly in these matters, and build each other up. Don't destroy each other over these trivial things, but rather lift each other up. And hopefully we all get to the same state of mind at one point and all live in freedom. But we're, we're all works in progress. We're all sinners. We're on our way towards perfection, but we're way far from there, aren't we? You know, so we're all works in progress. We all have weaknesses. Let's 
let's just be patient with each other. Let's forbear each other. Let's help each other. You can have sharp contradictions and arguments over doctrines at time, provided you're not destroying the person over it. You can have a lively debate. That Look at Paul and Silas. Or, well, that wasn't the best. Paul and Barnabas, I mean. But... Uh, He's putting a what construction? A good construction? Yeah, and we get when we, if you're a strong brother, you'll say when it, when Christ said it's finished, then that means it's finished, and you're living under grace, and you're free. So, yeah, um, and we should just rest in that and live in liberty. But we, you know, we all are weak <laughs> in a certain way. We we uh, wrestle with things. We tend to drift back toward the law at times, and we should just stick with the gospel under grace. Right? Is that what you're saying. Um, you know, in Galatians chapter four. Paul picks on the, up on these things and actually is a little stronger against the weak brother there. He says, um, verse 8 of Galatians 4, Formerly when you didn't know God, you were in bondage to beings that by nature are no gods. Are no gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and beggarly elemental spirits whose save slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years, I'm afraid I've labored over you in vain. So here he's actually chastising and going with what you're saying. Get to the gospel on this matter. Stop observing days and months and seasons and years. Stop esteeming one day is better than another. Aren't you free in Christ? So actually, in your case, that's what you're saying is he should bring in the gospel more to bear. And that's what he does in Galatians 4, where he actually in terms of laying down what's the strong and right position, it's freedom. Don't be under the law. Be free. And then he jumps down and ultimately says, tell me you who desire to be under the law. Don't you hear the law? He says in, also in Colossians, um, he says, uh, er, duh, 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 duh. He says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Diet or esteeming days. Don't let people pass judgment on you in these things. He says, these are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, taking a stand on visions puffed up, puffed up without favor, sorry, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head, etc. So, in other words, he says, he's, he's there in Galatians especially, preaching freedom and the gospel and what that means, which is don't go esteeming one day is better than another. Don't go going back to a dietary laws. You're free. So there he makes a strong point what you're saying on the gospel. But here he's also saying in Galatians and Romans, which apparently, if he brings this up in at least three of the letters I just mentioned in the last minute or so, it was a big issue for the church in those days, especially as Gentiles are mixing with Jews 
and Jews have kosher laws and the Gentiles don't and all these other things. Jews observed days and Gentiles didn't and how do we all get along in the church? Paul's saying, love one another, be patient, forbear one another. We'll all get there to the right position, but just be patient in the meantime. So, it makes sense. So we should just be patient with each other. I'd be patient with a Baptist brother. In fact, that came up on my boat recently. Someone asked me, how can you, as a pastor, allow drinking? That's surprising me that you'd allow someone to bring alcohol on your, on your boat. And I, I said, well, actually, um, you know, drunkenness is a sin, but uh, you know, certainly Jesus turned the water into wine, so wine's good, and we're free to do so. In 1 Timothy 6, take a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. I said, you know, it's, it's certainly permissible in Christian liberty to have wine or beer, but uh, it's not, um, you know, as long as you're not getting drunk, you're free to do so. I don't have a problem with it. So, uh, in that case, I was able to share, but I didn't like slam her over the head with it or something. I just said, this is why I do it. And uh, we're, we're free. And so, well, the, we went on to something else at that point. We didn't, I, I don't know that she believed it, but, uh, but, you know, some of her family was actually having a beer, but she didn't. She was more of a Baptist back, background. And that's okay. See, I, I'm not going to pass judgment on her for this. I'm not going to condemn her. I expressed what I believe is the Christian liberty, which is the Christian liberty. But, um, yeah, just be nice about it. Be nice. Just, you could summarize this chapter with, be nice. <laughs> Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Let's go a little further here. We'll go down to verse 12. Why do you pass judgment on your brother, says Paul? Or you? Why do you despise your brother? <clears throat> For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For as is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So each of us shall give account of himself to God. So why would you not want to judge or despise your brother based on those verses? A couple of reasons. It's not nice. <laughs> it's unloving. But also, you are going to stand before God to give an account of yourself. And by the way, spoiler alert, you're not the judge. He is. You're not the judge of your brother. He is. And so you don't want to go standing before God for judgment on the day of judgment and you having despised and destroyed your brother having passed judgment on him. So one reason not to pass judgment on the Lord is because, I'm uh, sorry, on your brother is fear of the Lord. You've got to stand before and give an account of this. Um, and uh, yeah, so everything, uh, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every tongue shall knee, bow and every tongue give praise to God. So you want to do it to avoid judgment. You want to do it to, uh, to just love. It pleases the Lord that you love one another. <coughs> and uh, express the truth. What do we say in uh, Ephesians? Uh, it says, uh, speak the truth, speaking the truth in love. The letter of the law, of Old Testament, kills. Right? If you speak the truth, but you don't do it in love, you're going to kill people. Easy to do. The truth, even the truth, even the truth, will kill people if you don't speak it lovingly and understandably and sensibly towards people. Um, but if you speak it with the right way, and we do our best, we're not perfect at that, but it's good. It's good to speak it that way. If you speak only love, but don't speak the truth, you're destroying people as well. You're just loving them to hell, in that case. You're just letting them go. You need to speak the truth. We need to do that in love. So share the truth with them in Christian liberty and all the, in the gospel and everything, but do it sensitive towards the other person and uh, in a loving way as best as you can. Sometimes they need a slap on the face, depending. Sometimes they need to be gently led. Just have to sense where those people are, right? Some people, only a slap on the face will ever get them anywhere. But some people are very sensitive, you know? Um, like my little dog Barnaby. All I had to ever do for him to teach him right from wrong is go, because um, he was a Shetland sheepdog, I go, um, Barnaby, because he was going into a plant one time he wasn't supposed to be in in our apartment. 
in St. Louis. And I was like, ah, Barnaby? Ah. Whoa, sorry, master. Didn't think that. I, I never want to do anything you don't like. I'm a sheep, sheep dog. All I live to do is please you. Yeah, I'll never touch it again. And he never touched it again. All I did was go, Barnaby? Ah. So he doesn't need to be slammed over the head. God bless him, I feel kind of bad, but sometimes I had to do that for Gracie when she was little because she was a, was a bull-headed, strong-headed, uh, yellow lab, and I could tell her 10,000 times, don't do this, and as soon as I turned around, boom, she destroyed something else. So I was like, a little stronger discipline. Ultimately, it just took two years of getting that out of her, and eventually she became the perfect dog, but, uh, uh, but uh, you know, we're different is the point. Just love each other. Be sensitive. And, we, and that's what we do here as Christians, right? In this church, we just, we're, we're kind toward one another. We, if we have a disagreement, we just want to be patient and share that with each other in a loving way. And sometimes we just have to let someone be in a different belief sometimes. In this case, well, you believe one day is better than another. That's not right, but uh, I love you anyway. I'll, I'll keep living in the right way. I'll live in my freedom. You live according to as your way. One day, maybe you'll know better. You know, so because we're all we're all works in progress, but we want to get to the right place as quickly as we can and, and live in Christian liberty, which is easier said than done sometimes, because of our conscience and because of the devil who's always throwing the law at us and works righteousness, and we ourselves tend to think that of ourselves sometimes and judge according to our ourselves by the law. Well, God's working with us. He's patient with us. Let's live in the Christian liberty and keep encouraging each other in that. That's why we're here to church to hear about liberty so that we can live in it and enjoy it.